I work on sex dissemination, and actually the, the origin and the nature of the sexes has occupied a very important place in, in the human mind for, for, for centuries. So already in the, in, in the Bible, there is a description of uh, uh, separate sexes. So separate sexes were uh, originated when God uh, took a rib from a man and created a woman, which for us scientists means that man originally were hermaphrodites, if we want. Um, Greek philosophers like Platoon also wrote about sex determination and the origin of the sexes. So the myth of Aristophanes shows that, uh, proposes that uh, in the beginning there were three genders, male, 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 female, and female, female. And because they were becoming very powerful, Zeus cut them in half. And actually the, the aim of our life is to look for other, our other half, if we want. Uh, similarly, the mechanism of sex determination, so what determines the sex of the baby, has been, uh, uh, has been having quite a lot of speculations. So from, there's always this dichotomy, left, right, hot, cold. Uh, so depending on the place, on the right or left side of the womb, uh, the baby will be a, a boy or a girl, and so on. So these this epigenetic views of, of sex determination have been progressively abandoned with, with discovery of, of sex chromosomes in the end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th century. And uh, there we are, the male and the female uh, uh, individuals are uh, determined by sex chromosomes. So the female has got two X chromosomes, the male has got an X and a Y chromosome. And what is quite striking immediately is that the Y chromosome is, is very small, is very, very, very small compared to the X chromosomes. And people have been quite uh, looking at this uh, quite, uh, quite frequently. And there's a model for why this Y chromosome has become uh, very small. So actually a model that, that explains how sex chromosomes arise. So sex chromosomes are thought to have arisen from autosomes when a male determining uh, or a sex determining gene uh, arises in an autosome and then close by there's a, a gene that gives an advantage for the male. So you want to stop recombination between these two genes so that the, the two genes are together in the same individual. So recombination suppression is the first step in the evolution of sex chromosomes. And then this non-recombining region progressively expands through acquisition of new genes that bring an advantage to that sex, but also because there's accumulation of repeats uh, and junk DNA because there's no recombination anymore. And in the long term, this lack of recombination starts to, 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 to induce this accumulation of junk DNA and slowly th this region starts to degenerate and there's gene loss and that's the reason why uh, uh, the Y chromosome is very, very small nowadays. So the, the only genes that are left in the Y chromosomes are genes that are needed for the, for the male sex. So of course the X chromosome doesn't uh, degenerate because in the females it, it keeps recombining. But all this, does this model work for all sex chromosomes? Is this reduction in the Y chromosome uh, size inevitable? Are the mechanisms of recombination suppression in these initial stages of the sex chromosome conserved across lineages? And why is it that some sex chromosomes are very, very uh, um, stable, like human sex chromosomes, but other sex chromosomes are, have a huge turnover? like uh, frog uh, uh, sex determining regions, in different populations of the same species, sometimes you have different chromosomes that determine sex. So all these, these questions, uh, people are starting to realize that despite the fact that meiotic sex, as we just heard, is very conserved across eukaryotes, the separation and the mechanisms that, that allow the separation, the differentiation between a male and a female are extremely, extremely diverse. So we can have, of course, the mechanisms that are epigenetic. So we come back to the epigenetics, like in the case of the crocodiles, where the temperature uh, uh, induces uh, um, sexual differentiation in the baby crocodile, but of course uh, the sex chromosomes with different sizes of regions and so on. What is striking is that the, the mechanism of sex determination, the different sexes have arisen independently in the different groups. It's not a single origin, it's different groups have different sex chromosomes. So the sex chromosomes of humans are not the same as the sex chromosomes of birds or of fishes or, or insects. But as you realize, I just saw, showed photos of animals and we are quite, it's quite, uh, Jean uh, uh, yesterday mentioned uh, uh, the fact that we are totally biased in terms of <laughs> research on, on basically on two groups, okay? Opistocons, so animals, and Archiplastidia, land plants. And we know 
virtually nothing about what's going on outside the tree of life. So these are two only small groups, relatively small in terms of diversity, in the whole uh, eukaryotic tree. Uh, if we want to fully understand the diversity of sex discrimination systems and the mechanisms behind, we need really to expand this taxonomic breadth to study things outside these classical model organisms. So this is what we've been doing uh, uh, in my lab for the last few years, and we are really interested in this group, this far away distant group, which is the brown algae that belongs to the straminopiles. So I point out that brown algae are almost as distantly related to land plants as they are to animals, even if they do photosynthesis. And brown algae are part of a very uh, small amount of groups, of eukaryotic groups, that have actually evolved towards complex multicellularity. So despite this diversity, there are very, very few groups, there are only five groups, that have tissues, organs, uh, uh, cellular differentiation, so uh, complex multicellular patterns. And these are, of course, animals, fungi, uh, plants, land plants, red algae, and brown algae. And, of course, we know no very, very little about developmental uh, patterning or sex chromosome evolution or, or anything actually on brown algae and actually in red algae also. It's very, very groups that haven't been looked at. So the brown algae are interesting for this uh, phylogenetic uh, uh, aspect. Uh, they are, of course, uh, they have enormous ecological importance for oxygen production in, in coastal areas and so on, but I, I will not go into that more ecological aspects. And there's a, another advantage of this group is that there's a a, a model brown algae. I don't want to be, I mean, it's not as sophisticated as Drosophila or, or Arabidopsis and so on. It's a, it's a small algae that we use as a model system for the brown algae. So for the last years in Roscoff, in collaboration with a number of labs uh, in a consortium, we've uh, developed this algae as a model uh, organism for the brown algae. And we developed a number of, of tools, genomic, genetic tools, uh, uh, reverse genetic tools and so on. Uh, and we, we started looking at, we use this algae to understand how sex is determined in this group that is so far away distantly related to, to plants and animals. So uh, the life cycle of these organisms to start with is already very different from what we are used to. So these organisms have a, a, a haploid sex determination. What does this mean? This means that the organism uh, in this diploid stage has got a male and a female sex chromosome, which I will call U and V, because this is not exactly like XY system, okay? So U for the female chromosome, V for the male chromosome, and the sporophyte is not sexual. Sex is determined at meiosis, depending on whether a spore receives a U chromosome or a V chromosome. If it receives a U chromosome, then it will grow and become a gametophyte, so a multicellular organism that produces gametes. But this organism is haploid. Okay? And it will then make female gametes or male gametes, then there is the syngamy, and uh, the cycle goes on like this. So this is strikingly different from what we are used to, to see, which is sex determination during the diploid phase of the life cycle, with XX, XY systems, or Z, uh, W, and uh, other sorts of systems. So this is important. The sex determination uh, uh, system of ectocapus, so it's with two types of sex chromosomes, a V chromosome determines maleness, U chromosome determines femaleness. I'm sorry I put blue and, and pink, which may not be uh, nowadays apparently very politically correct, but I think it's just uh, quite uh, easy. Okay, blue for the boys, <laughs> pink for the girls. Um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so the, what is striking is that the, the two chromosomes, cytologically, they, they show no difference. Okay, U and V are uh, very similar except for a region, for a small region, about one megabase pair, that contains about 20 genes in each. That is highly divergent, so it's male-specific region for the male sex chromosome, female-specific region for the female sex chromosomes. And so that this region, actually, the, it's, the recombination in this region is totally suppressed, even if recombination takes place in the pseudotosomal regions just outside. So what, it, what is striking also is that there is a symmetry. So male and female look relatively the same. The size of the non-recombining region is the same. The degree of the generation is the same. And I have to say that the degree of generation, the generation is very small. There's not a lot of the generation, which if we follow the model of sex chromosome evolution, would mean that these chromosomes are probably young sex chromosomes. But I won't go into detail on the methods, but we could date the emergence of these sex chromosomes in the brown algae, and we show that they are extremely ancient. They are more than 100 million years. So they are very, very ancient. So it's very striking 
how come that such an old system, the sex chromosomes are not degenerating in the system? Why is it, if, even if they are very, very old? So what is presenting, preventing degeneration? So actually, it, the reason for this that we think uh, it's happening is that these organisms have a very important haploid phase. So they have uh, multicellular development within the haploid phase, phase. And during the haploid phase, you're exposed to haploid purifying selection. So you don't have the other allele to compensate if you have a deleterious mutation. So we show that, in fact, sex chromosomes contain genes that are really important for this haploid phase. So that's why they must not degenerate. And looking at the expression of these genes, we also show that there's a quite of a different pattern of expression of the male and of the female chromosome during the life cycle. And the female, chrom the female chromosome contains genes that actually, di they didn't seem to have really a big, important role in insect expression. And we wonder if actually they were doing something, if the genes on the female chromosome were really doing something. And we use the mutant, a mutant of Ectocarpus that is continuously a gametophyte, so it continuously produces gametes even if it's diploid, triploid, or tetrapoid. So it uncouples ploidy with function. So we use this mutant to build something that doesn't exist in nature, which is a diploid gametophyte, so an individual that is sexual, and it has got together the, the, the V and the U chromosome, and we asked what is the sex of this individual. Um, it's a male. And then we did the same, we crossed it with a female, and with the triploid, that produced the triploid gametes, and the sex was still, phenotypic sex was a male. And with again the same, and tetraploid was a male. So this suggests that the presence of the male sex chromosome is sufficient to induce maleness. Uh, I wouldn't dare to say that the female are the default uh, stage, because we don't know really, because probably genes on the female are also important for the female functions, but at least uh, these experiments show that one chromosome, one male chromosome is sufficient to induce uh, male phenotype. And there is a gene actually in the, in the male specific region that is quite interesting, that shows a very striking pattern of expression consistent with the role in sex determination with a very high uh, expression during fertility. And this gene actually, it's a HMG domain protein coding gene. And HMD domain uh, uh, genes are involved in mating type determination in, in fungi and also in sex determination in animals, actually. So the SRI gene, the gene that determines sex in humans, uh, has got an HMD domain also. So we are currently, I cannot say this is the gene that determines sex in Ectocarpus because we are still validating it, but we have now uh, six uh, different, uh, we have six species of brown algae across 150 million years. With, we have the sex chromosome of, the, of this species, and consistently, this HMG domain gene is conservatively se sex-linked across all these species. So this is already a, a good clue for, for uh, as a strong candidate for sex determination. So we are now validating this, this candidate, so we have mm -hmm. a, a sex-reversed mutants, and we have a tilling mutants collection to, to, to validate the, the, the function of this gene as a sex determination gene. If we validate this, this means, it's very interesting because it means that there's some sort of convergent evolution. So, some types of genes seem to be particularly good at sex, and uh, I think uh, we'll have a talk about this uh, in a minute once, I, once I'm done. But this is uh, one really large evolutionary distances, so, so it's, quite, it's quite striking. So for a gene, for a, a sex chromosome that is relatively ancient, uh, we see that the sex chromosome the sex determining region is relatively small. It's not like enlarging as the, the model of sex chromosomes. And the reason for this, we think it's because there's not a lot of sexual dimorphism. So in the end, there are males and females in ectocarpus, and there are morphological differences, but they are not really peacocks. So you can't really see a huge morphological difference uh, uh, between the males and the females, except, well, the structure of the, of the, the reproductive structures, the, the size of the gametes, the female produces a pheromone, well, there are subtle differences. And underlying this, indeed, only 8% of the genes on the genome show a different expression level in males and females. And this is in contrast, for example, with Drosophila, where half of the genome of Drosophila is differentially regulated in, in males and females. So it means that there are probably not enough sexual antagonistic forces to, to induce this, this expansion of the non-recombining region. So a consequence of the fact that the, 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 the non-recombining region is small is that the pseudotosomal regions just next door are relatively large. And this is quite different from what we're used to in, in, uh, in, in the XY system in, in humans, where, where pseudotosomal regions are relatively small compared to the non-recombining region. 
And this, this pseudotosoma regions of sex chromosomes have been, have been uh, quite mysterious uh, regions of the genome because they are very hard to assemble. And I have to say we had very, very nicely assembled PAR regions in ectocarpus because we did the sequencing with Sanger. And uh, this facilitated a lot the assembly of this genome. So we took advantage of this to look at how, how are these regions evolving. And I will cut a long story short because we characterize these regions. In fact, these are quite extraordinary genomic regions with very strange characteristics that are not exactly like autosomes, as we would suppose, because they are recombining. So we would say, well, they must be like autosomes. It's not. The structure is very different. The types of genes that are inside are, are uh, uh, quite striking. And I'll just focus on something that I find particularly interesting, is that the ectocarpus par is significantly enriched in orphan genes. So orphan genes are genes that arise specifically in one lineage. And sometimes they are selected for and they stay in the genome. Other times, if they are not used to, then, then, then they will just disappear. But the, the, the ectocarpus part is, is full of these uh, uh, new genes, let's say. So, there's a, so there seems to be a higher rate of creation of new genes. And half of these genes are actually coming from exaptation of, of transposable elements that are in this region. And we use mathematical model, modeling in collaboration with, with a colleague, Denis Rose, to try to put this in a context of uh, population genetics and to see what are the advantages for a gene that is a new gene to be in the PAR region. And we show that, in fact, if a, re if a gene is advantages for one of the sexes and advantages for the sporophyte generation, it is selected for to be exactly on the PAR region. So I, I will talk about, if you, if you want to discuss the modeling, then I'm happy to discuss it at coffee. So now we are looking outside ectocarpus. So this is one of the brown algae. So we are starting to look outside. Uh, we have, uh, in the context of a sexy project and uh, a recent Fair Explorer project, a France Genomic project, we are sequencing about 50 genomes of different brown algae and looking at their sex chromosomes. And we started already looking for, for a few of them, like laminaria, so this kelp big algae, and in fact, we do see again these exceptional levels of gene traffic in sex chromosome, and actually an excess of retrogenes that are moving out of the sex chromosome to autosomes, and these retrocopies are functional, and they have a role in, in reproduction. And indeed, we are also validating this, this uh, idea that bigger sex-determining regions correspond to more sexual dimorphism, because indeed, uh, we can find the correlation between the size of the sex-determining region and the level of sexual dimorphism in this, in this algae. So um, I'll just wrap up uh, with some taking home message, if you want. So sexes have emerged independently and repeatedly in different lineages of eukaryotes. These haploid sex chromosomes do have a different evolutionary uh, history compared with X, Y, and Z, W systems, but there are some universal features uh, that have a reason, uh, possibly this, this same sort of genes that are recruited several times to, 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 um, as sex-determining genes. The life history traits are very important and have profound consequences on the evolution of sex determination. And the brown algae are a particularly interesting group to look at this because they show a large variety of life history traits that we can correlate with the evolution of their sex chromosomes. So I will finish here acknowledging the people in our group and our collaborators and uh, funding agencies, of course. And I leave you just with a, a very small, quick film of a, a sex in ectocarpus, so female and male fusion of two gametes. So the females uh, attach to the substrate, they, they, they uh, produce a pheromone that attracts the male, and then they fuse together. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to, to take questions in French, if you want. Question, Jean, Jean-François après. Avez-vous identifié le, ce qu'on appelle le boundary entre la région sexe spécifique et la partie pseudo-autosomique dans dans les génomes séquencés, et, euh, et vous regardez à la conservation de cette euh, frontière entre oui. la partie sexe spécifique et la partie euh, oui. euh, pseudo-autosomique. Oui, on regarde ça maintenant pour les nouvelles espèces. Euh, 
on a, pas, on a la, la région vraiment, la, la transition, la border, on, on l'a pour Ectocarpus. Pour les autres espèces, on a, on a une d'un côté et pas pour les autres. Mais la, la, la région, elle n'est pas la même parce que justement, euh, ces régions, elles bougent. Il y a comme un core, euh, core sex chromosome, core non recombining, et après ces régions, elles, elles, elles bougent pas mal. Donc c'est ce, ce que je peux vous dire pour l'instant. Pour les autres espèces, on n'a on pas encore de, de, assez de données. Jean-François Bach. Oui, nous avons organisé dans cette salle même, il y a, il y a quelques mois, avec Alain-Jacques Valeron et Claudine Junien, une, une réunion consacrée au, au dimorphisme sexuel. Et euh, moi, ce qui m'avait beaucoup surpris, ah, bien sûr, il y a un dimorphisme sexuel, tout ce qui est secondaire à l'imprégnation hormonale, les hormones sexuelles, ça, ça va de soi. Et bien sûr, je ne parle pas des systèmes de reproduction. Mais on était quand même arrivé à la conclusion qu'il y a quand même pas mal de caractères normaux ou pathologiques qui sont différents dans les deux sexes et qui ne sont pas apparemment liés à des différences d'imprégnation hormonale. Euh, C'est vrai, je disais donc, soit pour des choses comportementales ou autres, mais alors bien sûr, il y a toujours l'affaire du genre, du sexe, est compliqué, mais pour la pathologie, en tout cas, c'est clair qu'il y a des différences très importantes dans certaines maladies qui ne sont pas liées euh, apparemment aux, aux hormones sexuelles. Alors, vous avez dit qu'il y a assez peu de, de, de gènes, mais est-ce que quand même, on peut avoir une idée de ce qu'on sait, est-ce qu'on en connaît quand même une liste significative de, de, de gènes qui sont, qui s'expriment et qui ne sont pas directement liés à la, qui ne font pas intervenir à la sécrétion d'hormones sexuelles à proprement parler euh, pour les animaux, vous vous demandez. Oh, pour la euh, ouais. réunion, c'était chez l'homme, hein, ou la femme, si oui. vous voulez. Bon, là, je ne peux pas trop me... C'est plus éloigné de ce que je travaille. Je sais que pour, pour euh, les algues brunes, déjà, trois quarts des gènes, on n'a pas la fonction. Et ça revient <rire> sur ce que disait Jean Eisenbach hier. Euh, on ne connaît pas les fonctions. Euh, après... Euh, je ne sais pas, vous, si vous parlez des 50% des gènes, par exemple, en drosophile, qui sont différentiellement exprimés chez mâle et chez la femelle, ce n'est pas possible que la moitié du génome soit liée à, à des gènes liés aux hormones. Donc, il y a sûrement d'autres choses. Euh, chez l'homme, c'est pareil. Je n'ai pas en tête exactement quel est le pourcentage de gènes différentiellement exprimés chez le mâle et chez la femelle. Ça doit dépendre du, du organe, donc au cerveau. Euh, euh, évidemment, si on compare au vert, euh, euh, testicule, ça va être complètement différent, mais le foie, par exemple, c'est peut-être plus, plus similaire. Donc, c'est difficile à répondre à votre question de façon courte <rire> et tranchante. Oui. Est-ce qu'on sait comment euh, la recombinaison est réprimée Quels, quels sont les méca mécanistiquement Qu'est-ce qu'il y a derrière euh, Pour Ectocarpus, pour les agrudes, on ne sait pas de tout. Je pense que c'est très peu connu. Hein. Euh, normalement, c'est une inversion. Chez le chromosome XY, on pense que c'est dû à une inversion. Mais euh, un ectocarpus euh, dans les algues brunes, non, on ne sait pas. Comment, euh, chez les algues brunes, on passe de, du système UV où vous, que vous avez décrit au, à des systèmes comme le fucus où on a des... Oui. Des, des individus de diploïdes, mâles ou femelles Tout à fait. Oui, c'est une, une très bonne question. En fait, euh, ils sont indépendants. Euh, il y a eu entre, entre le fucus, donc les chromosomes sexuels de fucus, il y en a, mais c'est d'autres chromosomes sexuels. C'est indépendant. Ce n'est pas, euh, pas un système UV, c'est sûrement un système XY ou ZW. Et c'est indépendant. Ils ont émergé de façon indépendante par rapport aux au, au chromosomes que j'ai décrits ici. C'est la seule chose qu'on sait pour l'instant. Il est dans notre liste. 